Hello and welcome to another series of Ask Steve M. Uh, we've got an amazing episode today. Uh, we've got a lot of questions answered. Um, it's going to be very exciting. So what I want to do is I want to just get straight to it. Um, the topic is how apps are changing the world. So this is a very interesting one for a lot of people. Now what I want to talk about is number one is basically how apps are actually changing the world. So. Let's start it off. 91% of the top 100 global brands have an app, which is impressive. There are officially more mobile devices in the world than people, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Uh, there's over 7.3 billion, is it? Is it 7.3? I think something like that. So it's, it's quite a big number. So that's tablets, iPhones, iPads, Nokias, everything. So more Nokias, that's kind of interesting. Uh, the M68 was the code name for the first iPhone in 2004, which is kind of interesting. And it was so secretive that the hardware guys did not meet the software guys, and the software guys did not meet the hardware guys. So. Now what is an application? An application is a program or a group of programs that's designed for the end user. So I'm just trying to think of a good example. So if there's an itch in the... Uh, and the problem that you've got is basically this is a solution. It's a scratch to your itch is my best way to describe it. So a tiny little problem. So I don't know, there's a really good song in the background. You just don't know the name of it. Well, sh you Shazam it. Uh, if there's a you know, problem, you want to get a cab you know, straight away and you don't want to go to the taxi rank just around the corner, so you call for an Uber, okay? So uh, then anyway, before the release of the iPhone, uh, Apple had 14,000 employees. Staff numbers have doubled in the last four years alone, and the company now has 92,000 employees, which sounds a lot, but that's nothing compared to their closest competitor, Samsung. Samsung has more people than Apple, Microsoft, and Google combined. So it's a conglomerate, so uh, you're dealing with some heavyweights in the Samsung, and that's a huge percentage of the GDP. 79% of people with smartphones wake up and check their apps within 15 minutes of waking up. And I'm definitely in that category. Uh, first of all, um, I wake up to my alarm clock, switch it off onto aeroplane mode, check my emails very, very quickly. I just check them in the morning, then I check them again at 11 a.m., and then I check them again at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So I tend to actually only check emails in stages, in three stages throughout the day. The reason why is because I find it's a complete distraction and you're focusing on something and it takes 17 minutes to actually get that concentration back. So that's why I like to only read them in stages. In terms of apps, uh, the ones I'm big into, I use Evernote a lot. Um, I use that to keep all my notes of things. I also just use the normal Apple Notes as well. I use Keynote, which is really good on the iPhone. It's just as good on the iPhone than on the computer. I use a lot of other apps as well, such as um, some of the ones like the Foxtel app, which is fantastic. Um, I saw a really good documentary the other day called The Sugar Conspiracy, which is interesting, and I just taped it directly from my phone. Um, I also like the ABC app and SBS On Demand. If I'm just really interested in something, just quick and easy, uh, just to catch up on some stuff. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm one of those people and that's 79%. Uh, the total number of people accessing the web in China is more than double the entire population of the United States. Internet traffic soared through mobile devices that surged by 36.79 million in the last six months. Taking the number accessing the web through a smartphone to 594 million, or if you prefer 20 Malaysias or 28 Australias. So it's a very big population of people who are on the web now. As of December 2013, more than 500 million people have downloaded Candy Crush Saga. 
The game's premium model converts some of the users into paid customers, netting the game's maker nearly one million per day. So it's a, they're kind of really where it's at at the moment. Americans spend approximately 37 billion hours a year waiting in line. Now the reason why that's kind of relevant and why that's important is because with basically an apps, I believe one of the things that makes a successful app is something that saves you time. I believe that Uber, you're buying time. You know, you're basically, you know, sitting at a restaurant or whatever, you can call an Uber and by the time you're paying, paying the check, an Uber car has come straight to you. So you're actually saving time. You don't have to, you know, wait or anything like that. And so if you can actually, and the reason why the valuation for Uber is so high is because if they can bring a cab to you within four minutes, what else can they bring? Can they also bring, you know, food deliveries, pizza, can they deliver blood, can they deliver parcels? So basically, the huge valuation is they consider themselves as gonna be a logistics company and then there's a lot of other things that are moving into as well with driverless cars and things like that. So, Americans spend over $32 billion a year on pizza. So it's the number one go-to food. Now, Pizza Hut had a very interesting app and Domino's as well. And what was really interesting about that, and they did a very good job, I was very impressed. Number one, it, looked, it had a different experience on the iPad as it did on the iPhone. And I think that's really, really important when developing games. Develop for your device, develop for the behavior, develop for your customer, really understand those things. And they knew that People like to customize things, so by making your own pizza on an iPad, one, you, had, you actually had the space to do it, and number two, was actually people like actually having control and you know having a bit of fun. What was also good too, is that Pizza Hut and Domino's actually made more profit. The reason why, because most people when they corned up for a pizza just asked for a barbecue meat lovers with a, and then they'd say you want a Coke and a garlic bread for an extra three, three dollars or whatever and you go, okay, great, awesome. Um, but what actually it's done now is they've said, oh, actually, I didn't know you could actually do that. Or, you know, I actually might get some chili flakes, an extra dollar or, you know, dollar fifty or whatever it is. So what it meant was that chili flakes cost nothing. They literally buy bags of the stuff. It's, it's worth nothing. So just a tiny little sprinkle, that's just pure profit. So a lot of people are saying to add the extra features on. Like if you add chicken to your pizza, it's an extra three bucks. If you add uh, chili flakes, I think that's two dollars. If you add extra cheese, it's the same, oregano, all those um, extra things. And uh, they've always had them available, but now they're visually available. What was also good about the Pizza Hut app as well, which I'm quite amazed about, was they already had a little tracking device in the motor scooter. And what was interesting about the tracking device was that was already um, available to head office. What they did that was a little bit different was they said, well, hang on, we've already got that. Why don't we make those APIs available and push them through the app? Which meant that anyone could actually see where their pizza was and, and they could see how close it was, etc. and they could see if the driver was lost. And so it sort of opened up a huge opportunities and people thought that the app was revolutionary. It wasn't, it was just the missing link between the ones. Um, then I want to talk about the top three most frequently used applications for Chinese smartphone users. So number one is instant messaging, uh, search engines, and online news. Growth in smartphone internet users have also increased by the use of mobile payment, mobile shopping, and other business-related apps. So that's kind of cool. A London taxi driver needs to memorize 25,000 streets. An Uber driver just needs one iPhone. If you want to find out about the song is Shazam. Need a place to stay, Airbnb. Need a lift to the airport, Uber. It's becoming the verb. It's becoming something that is autonomous and is becoming the brand in itself. So try to think about with your name for an app or if you're working on an app or your company's got an app, try to work out a way that you can use it as a verb and a noun and an adjective, etc. Video games is quite an interesting point because I'm still from that generation who did buy games for $99. 
and everyone knows it was similar to the razor blades in the sense that they didn't make money from selling the handles, they made the money from the blades. So that it was pretty much that was their profit margins. So video games had a big flip because basically what happened was um, Microsoft made a lot of the revenue through the games and Nintendo, etc., etc. But games went from $99 to $9.90 to $0.99 cents to free within six years. In fact, it was probably even quicker. It was probably within three years it dropped so quickly. Um, when a lot of apps launched, they actually had it at quite a high price. Now, uh, it, it's very unusual. Um, everyone I know who launches an app always does it for free. Um, I still am from the older generation that I, I think you should actually make the product um, worth buying or to actually have it free, but there's also a paid version as well, which is called a freemium model. But I kind of take it to the next level. And I'm, it's, not, it's not just saying, okay, I'm actually saying make it a really amazing app strip the other one down that's free and then basically you know really drive everyone to the paid version so you can actually justify there's a huge value in it you know what you're actually getting and you can justify it look if it's one change it's probably not worth it you know if it's two changes three changes if it's nine times better then i can quite frankly justify it so if you gave away 10 percent of your content and then 90% of your content's in the paid, and you've got really cracking good content, put the best content in your free version to show, you know, this is what you're capable of doing. So an example would be, if you know your most popular recipe on your website was spaghetti bolognese, you know what? We kind of know that that's probably popular. It might be because it's Italian food, it might be because it's pasta, it might just be because it's, you know, it's sort of, food that's quite, you know, so you could say, okay, well, what about pizza? What about other sort of food that's quite, you know, simple? Um, so yeah, that's something I also believe in. Trust is shifting from corporations to individuals. Power is shifting. And it's true, and I think what used to happen in the Industrial Revolution, the more cars you ship, the more cars you sell, the more you advertise, the more money you make, and it's a constant cycle, it keeps feeding feeding the monster as you speak. What's happening now, and just on that point as well, what it used to be was basically the big corporations, you know, were the ones that, you know, basically had had the authority and everyone else sort of, and then the ad agencies wanted to get in touch with them and it's just spread down like that. What's happening now is it's been pushed to the edges. So now suddenly you're now listening to the person who you know, you work with and he says, oh, I recommend this guy. Or you're working with someone else and they say, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy that peanut butter. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty average. And now on social media, suddenly now the speakerphone has gone out on steroids. So yes, I, I, do, I do believe that it's changing, you know, your, your reputation online and the way people are using it. And I know what people are gonna say, they're gonna say, what, but, but that's what people did with eBay and all that, but you were kind of anonymous. Um, with apps, it's a little bit different. You are still connected and you are actually have a, um, a sort of a, a rating against you as a passenger and as a driver. A really good example was Lyft over in the US, anytime I go to California, I, I always catch a, a Lyft, L-Y-F-T, and it's similar to Uber. But what's, what's interesting about it was, when you get in the cab, you sort of give a bit of a rating. But if it's below three points for you as a passenger, then basically you don't get matched up again with the same driver. So basically, if there's something that you're doing or you're being rude or you know something like that, then basically the experience is getting harder and harder and you know basically the app isn't working so there's an emphasis um, to actually you know be, be on your best behavior and then number two I think what Uber's really done is they've regulated the industry um, I know from traveling in many parts of the world uh, the taxi system takes you a bit on a wild goose chase sometimes it also um, there's a lot of scams that sort of happen around the taxi industry in places like Egypt and Brazil. And so it's basically regulated the industry. So in regards to the music industry, Pharrell Williams earned less than $3,000 for 43 million downloads of his song Happy. 
Um, this is a serious disruption model. Um, personally, I'm not really um, see it as a positive way in any way, shape, or form. I think it is quite a serious, uh, serious shift that's happening, and I think something's going to change. Um, a lot of concerts now, like Madonna, uh, tickets are selling for three hundred dollars minimum. So they've now had to look for other means because it's really, really difficult. The old model, which was a freemium model, the very first freemium model was radio. You listen to a song on the radio, from listening in on the radio, you went to the record store and you know you went to the CD shop or whatever and you bought the album. The album was thirty dollars. It's kind of amazing to think an album was thirty dollars and there's only really one or two songs that you really wanted to listen to, and that was about it. So um, it's become, you know, a little bit of a case of they thought that disruption was going to be television but it but it wasn't television just meant that people made really good video clips for music and they thought oh, okay well look it's probably not going to be you know it's going to be I don't know something else like CD-ROMs or you know something like the Walkman or the iPod and to a certain extent it was a little bit of the iPod but really when the apps came in it really shifted um, I listen to Pandora when I get in the car and I don't pay a cent um, I haven't upgraded to the premium one. Um, it's one of the only things I do. I, I don't watch television, and if I do watch television, I do tape something. I tape it from my phone, and I fast forward the ads. I don't listen to radio, uh, news sources. I only read, you know, sort of Mashable and TechCrunch and those sort of ones. I don't read the usual um, sort of news ones, and you know, I use a lot of apps that actually um, congregate. Uh, some of the best, uh, some, some of the best news items, and um, you know I can run through some of those ones later on if you're interested. Um, but yeah, I really think that uh, ones like Spotify and there's one called iHeartRadio, and there's ones called uh, um, there's another couple of ones I think TuneIn. I think you can listen to any radio station in the world, and uh, it doesn't cost anything. Uh, dive deep, not wide. This is one by my friend uh, Dale Beaumont. And uh, this is actually an interesting one that I actually think is relevant to apps more than ever. Everyone gets carried away for how many platforms it's going to be on. Is it going to be on Android? Is it going to be on the Apple Watch? Are we going to have it on tablets? What about this size and this screen? But you've got to remember that Instagram was bought for over a billion dollars and they only had an iPhone app. Not an iPad app as well. The website didn't even work as a website. You couldn't log in. It was just a picture of a phone with it working and it just said, click here to get it from the app store. So I think everyone gets very carried away about, you know, we got to get on Android and just rush into that. And I really think just, just hold off. People still get an iPhone app. Don't rush into it. Just go, you know, get that experience right really really get it right and then once you get it right then it's very easy just you know sort of applying it to different ones after there's a bit of demand for it but i really think there's enough people um to initially get you started with an iphone start making some revenue or start getting some sponsors or start getting some investors or whatever and then you can start expanding because it does get expensive so what i have seen is a lot of people spread themselves way too wide way too wide they spend a fortune and it just doesn't need to be it doesn't need to be one in four apps are abandoned after the first use so it's not a very it's not a very positive it's not a very positive result it's incredibly important if you get a chance read a book called hook um, and basically what he talks about is you have triggers, whether they're internal or external. External, everyone knows what the external triggers are. They're things like a link on a website or the app icon or, you know, a mail or something like that, an email that arrives in or you see something on Pinterest. But then you've also got the internal triggers and internal triggers are things like um, you know, people go onto Facebook when they're bored or people read email when they're depressed and they've done studies to actually prove that that's correct. So anyway, you've got to basically get those triggers right from the beginning and then it goes into action. So, and then it goes into a reward, you know, and a, a reward might be something like you've earned 30 credits or, you know, you've just, you know, you've just gained a star or you've gained a, you know, 
20 points um, or your friend wants to challenge you in something and you think oh wow so it's either got that social element that keeps pulling you back in or it's giving you a gift and then by giving you a gift it pulls you back in for a second time and then that second time you still don't know what it is don't use that opportunity to you know trying to say, hey, sign up to the premium model because it doesn't work. Get people into something that might be of interest. Hey, I've got a song that you might be interested in and really target it to find what that person might be interested in. Then basically you come back and then there's a reward because you know, you've know you unlocked that or whatever. You've now got an extra level in a game or you know, you've got something else that keeps you going. So it's very, very important. And that actually gives the next point, 80% of apps are zombie apps, which is absolutely correct. And brings me to the next point, mobile is all about experience. And I completely agree. I believe user experience is incredibly important. I think every company should really, really get good at user experience. I think it's, uh, you know, UI and UX design uh, are probably one of the highest paid jobs at the moment. Um, in Sydney and in the US, it's one of the highest average. I think a average is about 150,000, something like that. Um, so it's a very, very important role and I can completely justify it, but you really have to have a good experience. You have to have very clever reasons to why people will keep in the app, why people actually download the app, all different areas of it, different wireframes, even prototyping. It's much cheaper, don't go straight into development spend a lot of time and effort thinking about sort of stuff, creating prototypes, creating wire wireframing, anything you can to basically um, focus on the experience. It's very, very important. Technology has made renting things, even in real time, as simple as buying things a decade ago from Fred Wilson, who's a venture capitalist. So yeah, so I do actually believe there's gonna be more of that renting technology that's gonna start happening. So things like, you know, you might have a parking space at home, but you need a parking space at the office. So when I'm not there, sure, between nine to five, you can you can park in my driveway and look, you can pay me 20 bucks or whatever. I really don't mind, it doesn't, doesn't bother me because I'm not using it, but then I do actually need the parking space um, you know in the office so it's kind of like if there could be a good sort of ju justification even if it's $25 I can justify it you know if it's $20 it's fantastic and it's a total no-brainer I don't think anyone's going to figure out a way that you can completely evenly um, equal the same amount but um, there's a few parking apps that we've been working on recently uh, there's one Parkeroo which is launching soon. Uh, the sharing economy is really about renting or borrowing. Everything will become on demand. On demand is the big is the big thing that we're into now. Um, people don't really like telephone calls anymore. I don't know if anyone's noticed, but people don't like telephone calls. People like sending text messages because it's saying, "Well, look, I can get back to you anytime I want." So. That's what's sort of happening with tech, text messages. Um, it's also happening with TV shows. I don't really watch Q&A anymore. I just wait if there's a bit of news or something that happens, then maybe the next day I might, you know, stream it on, you know, ABC iView or something like that on my phone, or I might listen to it on the train or something like that. So there's, there's a few little things like that, which is um, basically on demand, but a lot of other things gonna become more more on demand. There's a very successful business um, in California at the moment, I think across across the US, and it's basically a massage um, that comes to you, and uh, it's very, very popular. There's a lot of other ones that are sort of doing, there's a lot of cleaning ones, things like Task Rabbit, and you know, there's a lot of things around that on demand. Um, I'm personally not into those um, apps and I don't really kind of work with those apps and for the very basic reason is that the problem is you've got two services and well, one it's service which I don't really like getting into the service industry um, you know some of the salaries can be very expensive um, it just there's a, there's a lot of work involved dealing with people you can't really automate things as easily as other businesses but basically, what actually you can do from um, from something like this one called Air, Air Tasker, which I think is great. It's a really great name, Air 
from Airbnb and Task from TaskRabbit, so AirTask, it's, it's a brilliant name. I like the logo, the idea of it's fantastic. The problem is you, you pay a amount of money or something to get this guy and then you put a lot of effort to get this guy then you match him up but there's no reason to keep people to go back once you've connected those people okay there's a lot of effort a lot of man hours a lot of expense to get these two people to connect once they do connect they say hey next time can you come back in a month and can you mow the lawns again or you know can you come again well you don't really need the app anymore so it's sort of served a sort of a once-off um, opportunity so I'm personally don't really get involved with um, a lot of those sort of task orientated and service based ones but I do think there's a lot of stuff with on demand delivery of food I still I still I still think we've got huge potential in that stuff um, delivering of a lot of things I really think there's you know some massive opportunities down that path um, so yeah build a great product the app store is the closest thing to a meritocracy what I like about the App Store is that within the first 48 hours of launching any app, you do get the opportunity to compete against some of your rivals and the bigger players in the marketplace. And it's not just based on downloads. Um, you could get a thousand downloads and your competitor gets 10,000 and yet you're in the number one position. So um, I personally think if it's a good idea, you know, then it will fly. It, it, it will. It will fly. Over a period of time, people do find out about really good apps. Make a great product. Make a great app. Um, do all your promotion within 48 hours. But I do think um, you know it's not. It's not rigged. There's no sponsorship. There's nothing you can do to pay for the top spot. Or there's no. You know, there's no sort of thing that's, it, it really is based on, you know, there's a little algorithm they've got and it's not just based on the size of the company or the revenue or, you know, this, it's, it's actually quite, um, is your product that much better that it warrants a change in my behavior? So they often say to develop the behavior and then the technology to wrap around it. So if everyone's walking, you know, to the shops every day, okay, well, you know, maybe with technology, you think, okay, well, maybe that's, you sort of build something that is doing to what they're currently doing. What tends to happen is they create the tech technology and they say, we want people to walk around this. Well, that's just not what people are currently doing. So you need to find what behavior people are currently doing and then basically, you know, keep that behavior, but then, you know, is it, it's a tiny little change to get something. And uh, there's a thing called lock-in effect or vendor lock-in. And what vendor lock-in is, is basically you will stay with Microsoft Word because you know how to use it. You know where the features are, you know how to save it, you know how to export it, you know how to bring in pictures, there's no confusion. So there might be a better software that comes out or a cheaper bit of software that comes out, but you're, you know, and you and your staff are all comfortable with using Word, you will probably stay with Word unless Word really goes down the hill and then there's enough of a reason to change. Or the other app that's the competitor is a much, much better experience, much easier to use. A good example about change, change of the behavior, something that they did with uh, Snapchat was they straight away had the camera as soon as you open up, it was just ready to go. And I think that was good. I think it's good skipping steps. If it's a weather app, get people straight into the weather. We're about to say are straight away. Don't muck around. Don't, you know, take them through an intro screen or an advertisement or whatever. They don't want to see it. And if it's slow to load, put all the heavy stuff, like the settings, put that all sort of tucked away where you have to actually go to try to find it, to change it. But I think there's a lot of things you could pre-do. The only country that uses Fahrenheit is America. That's the only country that uses it. So everyone has else has changed to the metric system. So I guess what's kind of interesting about that is if you launch an app for the American App Store, probably automatically change it to so naturally it's in Fahrenheit and the rest of the world. So you might actually have to launch it twice. Snap, snap, Snapchat broke the rule by putting the camera first and reduced the number of steps to one tap instead of several. Um, then also as well, is basically any other questions that anyone has, I'm more than happy to help. Anyway, I'll speak soon. Ciao.